here at UCO. It's great to see everybody here today, a nice crowd. I am proud to say that this is a place where the free exchange of ideas is encouraged. Amen. And freedom of speech and expression is fundamental to who we are here at UCO. This is in part why we are here today. This is a place with an agenda. Not a political agenda. It's not to divide or to disparage or to deny. It is simply this, to help students learn so that they may become productive, creative, ethical, and engaged citizens and leaders serving our country and the global community. And in order to do that, this place has a long history of providing our students with opportunities and to experience new things, to gain new perspectives, to hear new ideas. So they can figure out what it is that they believe, what they want to say, how they want to live their lives. My role today is to introduce our speakers, Mr. Ken Ham and Dr. Georgia Purdom. But before I do, I would like to share with you my understanding of what is happening here this afternoon. We are a diverse group of people gathered together in a safe place, a place that honors and expects civility, just as we have on this campus for the past 127 years. And as I said, this is a place where we can all come together to respectfully listen and decide on our own what we want to believe. As always here at UCO, we owe our speakers and other attendees our utmost courtesy and must demonstrate that by, uh, demonstrate that rather, by behaving in a civil manner. Attendees who violate that courtesy and disrupt the speaker's presentation may be subject to removal. Again, basic courtesy is expected. Now there will be a short break after our speakers finish their comments this afternoon. And then there will be a question and answer period following that break. In your program this afternoon, there is a form, and I believe you also received a pen or a pencil that uh, will enable you to write any question that you may have during the presentation. And when you have written your question, pass that along so that it can be collected at the aisle, okay? So we'll collect that before the break, and after the 15 minute break, there will be a question and answer period. And with that said, I would like to tell you a little bit about our speakers today. Ken Ham is the president and founder of Answers in Genesis, which is a ministry dedicated to enabling Christians to defend their faith and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ effectively. Mr. Ham founded the Creation Museum in Petersburg, Kentucky, and created the Ark Encounter in Williamstown, Kentucky, he is in high demand throughout the nation, North America, as a Christian speaker and has appeared frequently on American TV, including Fox's The O'Reilly Factor and Fox and & Friends, CNN's The Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer, ABC's Good Morning America, as well as the BBC. Also presenting today, Dr. Georgia Purdom. Dr. Purdom holds a PhD in molecular genetics from The Ohio State University. She formerly, uh, formerly served as an assistant and associate professor of biology at Mount Vernon Nazarene University. She is the ministry content administrator and actively speaks and writes for Answers in Genesis. Now please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the University of Central Oklahoma, Mr. Ken Ham. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, the welcome and thank President uh, Betts for the uh, gracious invitation to come and to be able to have the opportunity uh, to speak to you. And I want to thank all of the university staff that have so welcomed us and been so gracious uh, toward us. As was said, I'm from the organization called Answers in Genesis. I'm going uh, to present here for about half an hour or so, and I always add, or so. 
Uh, and then Dr. Purdom uh, will present for about the same time, and then, as said, we'll break to then prepare for the question time. I actually grew up in Australia, so that means I have a deep southern accent. And this is the true southern accent. And it's interesting being over here in America because I have people uh, who say to me, you know, being an Australian in America, they say, it doesn't matter what you say, we just love to hear you saying it. So I hope that's your attitude this afternoon too. I have one wife, you'll be pleased to know, and, oh, you know what? They haven't been bringing anything up on the screen. So we need to see if they can bring up the screen here. And we'll... There we go. Okay. Is that working? Yeah. I better show you that, because otherwise you wouldn't know what Australia looked like. <laughs> so there we are. So here we go. So as I said, uh, wife, Maui, and five children, and we have uh, 16 grandchildren, though if you count them there you only see 15, because there's one with a bit of a bulge. Uh, and there he is now, 16. Uh, there we are. By the way, that's a pro-life statement in case you uh, didn't get that. And we certainly do love our 16 grandchildren, although there's a bias against boys in, in that group by the look of that. Well, as was said, in 2016, actually, we opened the Life Size Ark. It's the biggest timber frame structure in the world, and it's in Williamstown, Kentucky, and you can walk through all three decks. It stands seven stories high, up to ten stories high at the bow. In 2007, we opened the world's first major creation museum, which is really walks through the Bible, life-size exhibits, animatronics and planetarium, special effects theater, and so on. And people, millions of people actually, have come from all over the world to go to those facilities. In 2014, uh, I, I, actually four years ago, in February, debated Bill Nye, the science guy, at the Creation Museum. And that debate, we conservatively estimate, has now been seen by around 20 million people worldwide. One of the things that I did at that debate was to deal with a topic concerning science because Bill Nye claims that because we as biblical creationists, as Christians, believe the creation account in the Bible, that that's religion, but because he believes in molecules to man, evolution, naturalism, that that's science. And so one of the first things I did with Bill Nye was to talk about what the word science means. It comes from the Latin scientia, which means to know. I mean, if you look up dictionary, it'll give you definitions like state of knowing or knowledge. And I, I challenged Bill Nye that really there's different sorts of knowledge. For instance, there's what we call op operational science or observational science. Knowledge you gain by using your five senses in the present and you can test and, and repeatedly test uh, your observations. And, and that's the sort of science that builds our technology. But then there's a different sort of knowledge, knowledge about the past. When you're talking about origins, no one of us was there to see the origin of the universe. We weren't there to see the origin of the first people. And so then you're dealing with the area of beliefs. And we call that historical science. And I challenged Bill Nye that he needed to admit there's a difference between what we can observe and test and your beliefs about uh, the past. Now he uses the same word science for both. But we like to distinguish the types of knowledge here. And in fact, to do that I thought I would mention forensic science. And the reason I mention forensic science is because forensic science actually involves both observational science and historical science. In fact, at the debate, let's listen to what Bill Nye said. So let me ask you all, what would you be doing if you weren't here tonight? That's right, you'd be home watching CSI. CSI Petersburg. Is it coming? I think it's coming. And on CSI, there is no distinction made between historical science and observational science. These are constructs unique to Mr. Ham. We don't normally have these anywhere in the world except here. So uh, CSI is a fictional show, but it's based absolutely on real people doing real work. When you go to a crime scene and find evidence, you have clues about the past. And you trust those clues and you embrace them and you move forward to convict somebody. You see, the problem with what Bill Nye was saying is that forensic science can also make mistakes. Because there have actually been people convicted of crimes because of forensic science, only to find out later they didn't have all the evidence, and there was a piece of evidence that came along that showed a particular person was actually innocent. In fact, from Nature, 2000 
and 15, we read, everyone in the medico-legal community, forensic scientists and technicians, DNA analysts, potential jurors, judges, lawyers for both the prosecution and defense, must know and understand the potential for mistakes. And from the University of Michigan website about a national registry of exonerations, the registry provides detailed information about every known exoneration in the United States since 1989, cases in which a person was wrongly convicted of a crime and later cleared of all the charges based on new evidence of innocence. Here's a problem. When it comes to the past, we don't have all the information. And there could be one piece of information that can totally change your conclusions, because we are not infinite beings. You know, it's interesting, one of my favorite detective programs is uh, Hercule Poirot. Try to pronounce that right. Practice that for a million years. <laughs> maybe, maybe only the younger people here probably don't, don't even know who Hercule Poirot was. But anyway, it's one of my favorite programs. And here's a detective, and you, you, you're there watching one of the programs, and you find out real early the butler did it. And then as you keep going through, you find out, yeah, the butler definitely did it, and it kept pointing to the butler, the butler did it, the butler did it. You get two minutes before the end of the program, and he brings all the suspects into a room, and he goes around and talks about each one of them, and more and more you realize the butler definitely did it, until suddenly, 30 seconds before the end, he gives you one piece of evidence that was withheld from you for the whole program, totally changes your conclusions, it was someone you didn't expect, and you realize you got it wrong, end of movie, waste of time watching it, feel like kicking the TV in the teeth, or something like that. But you see, there's the problem. If you don't have all evidence, you can come to wrong conclusions. Now, with forensic science, they do observational science, like fingerprinting and blood typing. That's what I call observational science. But also, there's an element of historical science, uh, interpretation in regard to what happened in the past when you were, weren't there. And you can actually make mistakes. And obviously, the further you get away from the present, the more likely uh, the problems will be. Now, one of the things that uh, Bill Nye said was, well, if you believe in molecules to man evolution, that's science, but, but you people, uh, Ken Ham, you start with the Bible, and your account of origins comes from the Bible, so that's religion. You know, I admit that the account of origins, I believe, does come uh, from the Bible. It was interesting, when the museum opened in 2007, organization in California was contracted by the BBC to interview me and she came into my office uh, there in northern Kentucky and uh, she said to me now she said you start with the Bible right and I said that's correct and she said you're not prepared to change anything in the Bible I said no I'm not prepared to change anything in the Bible and she said see that's religion she said I'm a scientist we start with evidence from evidence we develop our theories and when new evidence comes along we're prepared to change you're not prepared to change. I said, let's clarify. I'm not prepared to change what's in the Bible. And she said, yeah, but your, your views are set. That's religion. Whereas she said, our views are not set because we start with evidence and we're prepared to change uh, if, if we need to. And I said, now, can I ask you a question? Yes. Well, you're an atheist. That's right. You don't believe in God? No. You don't believe the Bible uh, could be true? No. You, you, you wouldn't be prepared to possibly consider the account in Genesis for origins? She said, no, not at all. I said, are you willing to change that? Because the point that I was making to her was this. Yes, my starting point is the Bible, but you have a starting point too. You've already decided that the Bible's not true. You, you already have a starting point that everything is explained by natural processes, and that determines how you look at the evidence and interpret the evidence. And see, that's important for all of us to understand that we all have starting points. We all have presuppositions that determine how we look at the evidence. And besides which, I want to suggest something to you. In a sense, we do start with evidence because the Bible is evidence. It exists. You can't deny it. It is a real book. It does claim to be, whether you believe it or not, the Word of God. It claims uh, that there's a revelation for us to tell us who we are, where we came from, the history of the universe to explain the evidence of the present. And so what I'd want to do in the section that I am talking to you about was to sort of set the scene and to give you a broad overview of what Christians actually believe, what creationists actually believe, and then Dr. Purdom is going to actually go and do some details as a PhD in molecular genetics and uh, show you more uh, technical understanding of some of those things. So as we go uh, on here, uh, let's look at the account of origins in the Bible, because this is our starting point as biblical creationists. 
that God created a perfect world, created two people, Adam and Eve, from whom all others are descended, that Adam rebelled against God and sin and death came into the world, the origin of death, and then there was a global flood and eventually a Tower of Babel uh, causing different people groups to move out over the earth. What I want to do is just quickly show you how we work as biblical creationists. Each one of these topics you could spend a long time on. So obviously I'm going to be brief uh, for the time that we have. And so let's show you how we believe observational science confirms you can't prove, you can't absolutely prove things in relation to the past because we're finite beings, but at least confirms uh, the account of origins in the Bible. The Bible starts off, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We believe God created the universe, he created all life. So we would say that there'd be evidence that life is a result of an intelligent creator. It's interesting, when Watson and Crick, those famous scientists in England, discovered the helical structure of DNA in 1953, that's how I remember when my wife was born. I have to remember when Watson and Crick discovered the helical structure of DNA. But they actually were atheists, and they actually made the statement that they did this research because they wanted to show the world that there was no God and that life is built on chemistry. Well, actually, we've done a lot of studies since then on DNA, and we know something about DNA. It's not just chemistry. It's a code system. It's an information system. We also know that there's no way, ch by chance random processes, matter can produce a code. Uh, codes come from an intelligence. Information comes from information, ultimately from an intelligence. We would say, actually, a study in the present on DNA confirms an intelligence behind life, not natural processes. Uh, when you start in Genesis 1, we read that God created kinds of animals after their own kind. In fact, you read that phrase, after its kind, ten times in Genesis 1. That's a statement of biology, by the way. And then in Genesis 6, we read again about kinds that went on the ark. When I debated Bill Nye, one of the things he said to me was, there's no way the account of Noah's ark could be true because Noah couldn't fit all the millions of species of animals on board. He didn't take millions of species of animals on board. You see, the Hebrew word that's translated kind is the Hebrew word mean. And here's what we would say. In our classification system, where we have kingdom, farm, class, order, family, genus, species, we would say in the majority of instances from the research we've done, not all, but the majority of instances, the Hebrew word translated kind is actually at the family level of classification. For instance, if you take dogs, we had researchers do this for the Ark Project, looked at groups of, of living animals and then looked at the fossil record to come up with how many actual kinds are there. A lot of work has been done on dogs and you can show how different species are bred with others and how they're all interconnected, which means they're all the one family. And we would say that that represents, the, the family candida represents the dog kind. In other words, you don't need two dogs on the ark, not all the dog species. In the ark project, we actually have on the first deck a cutaway model of the ark, and we have a summary on uh, the sign there of the research that uh, our researchers spent years and years doing. It's published in our Answers Research Journal. How many actual kinds of land animals are there? And we would say overestimating about 1,400. We even think it's probably less than 1,000. But this is overestimating in the way they did their calculations. And so you have two of each kind, seven pairs of some on the ark. They come off the ark after the flood as they move away from each other. Uh, it depends on you know, what combinations of genes they have, which ones survive in which areas. Actually, through natural selection, adaptation, you end up with different species. Creationists believe in speciation. They believe in natural selection. There's a lot of people think that we don't. Of course we do. It's what you observe. And this is why we would represent biology this way, that God made separate trees, the dog tree, the elephant tree, and so on, the dog kind, the cat kind, the elephant kind. And you could have lots of branches within that tree because of all the genetic information that's there, but the tree stays separate, so it's an orchard. But for those who believe in molecules to man evolution, like Bill Nye, he believed in one tree and that all life is related. It goes back to some uh, primeval soup where life uh, supposedly first began. And so we certainly believe in speciation within a kind, and actually, as Dr. Purdom is going to show you, that can actually happen quite ra rapidly and has been documented as happening as more rapidly than we even have thought. I have a friend in California, Ray Comfort, uh, who uh, has an organization called Living Waters, and he interviewed a number of people, professors at universities, students at universities in California, 
about what, what is the evidence that you can show that one kind changes into another. Usually, when people I talk to uh, give evidence for supposed evolution, it's usually speciation, and particularly, say, Darwin's finches. When they change of kinds, you mean the evolution of one species from another or to another. Yes, we have that in action, actually, in the Galapagos. Could you give me one instance? Yes, we have an example from a group of birds called Darwin's finches. And you take a look at the difference between the finches on the islands that all started out. I mean, that's very, very observed. But that's not Darwinian evolution. There's been no change of kinds. What do the finches become? They become genetically new and anatomically new, recognizably different species. So they're still finches? <laughs> well, of course they're still finches, yes. So they're not a change of, there's no change of kind. Little birds that he, uh, that he had observed that... Oh, what did they become? Um... Their beaks, their beak shapes. They're, they're still birds. birds. Yes. Three finches that turn into different types of birds. Based they're on still the finches. Beak. Well, for example, Darwin. Anyway, so it goes on. It's interesting. When I ask a, a lot of people, what's the evidence for evolution, you'll get examples like that. We don't deny there are different species of finches. Uh, but that's the point. Uh, they're finches. And you can have great variation within a kind because of the genetic potential that's already there. What we would say is this. Natural selection operates on the information that's already there, that God created. And so we would see new combinations of information, uh, already existing information, loss of information. Uh, we see cons conservation of information. But what we don't see is matter producing brand new information to code for a characteristic that wasn't potentially possible before, which is the opposite of a molecules to man process. So we would say that... Um, science of genetics actually confirms the kinds that God gives us there in Genesis 1. The Bible goes on and talks about the entrance of, of death into the world. This is an important issue because I find a lot of the millennials, one of the most asked questions that they ask Christians is how can you believe in a loving God if there's all this death and suffering in the world? And not only that, there's an implication in regard to geology because geology is full of death. Lots of fossils in layers. Uh, some of those layers of the Grand Canyon are continental in extent and even similar layers uh, that exist in other continents. They're really global in extent. The late Dr. Carl Sagan said this, the secrets of evolution are time and death. Time plus death leads up to man. Millions of years of death. For those who believe in uh, biological evolution, uh, they believe that there's been death. Death basically since the beginning. But when you read the Bible, God says after he created all life that everything was very good. But then tells us about an event when he created the first man as a test of obedience not to eat the fruit of a particular tree because if you do, you will forfeit your right to live. It would be an act of uh, disobedience against the God of creation. And so Christians would tell uh, you that uh, sin came into the world when Adam rebelled. That's the origin of sin. That's why we say that people are sinners and death as a result of sin. And it's one thing that we can prove to you very much that, uh, that death is here with us right now. We see it every day. In fact, everyone in this room one day will die. Uh, you, you all have to face death. But the Bible gives us the origin of death. It's because of sin. And even though our bodies die, we're made in the image of God. So we have a soul that's going to live forever. But God wants us to live forever with him in the garden he actually killed animals and made clothes for Adam and Eve. By the way, that's the origin of clothing. I notice you're all wearing clothes today, which is very good, by the way. I'm glad about that. But the animals don't wear clothes. If we're just animals, why do we wear clothes? Anyway, there's an interesting thought for you. So, actually, this is the first blood sacrifice as a covering for their sin, a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was actually a picture of the message of salvation uh, in God's Son. Now, we're not connected to the animals, though the Bible says, an animal's blood can't take away our sin. A man brought sin and death into the world, so a man would need to pay the penalty for sin. It'd have to be a perfect man, but it can't be us. We're all descendants of Adam, we're all sinners. So what did God do? He stepped into history. Bethlehem, the babe in a manger. And he became a man, a perfect man, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead, and offers a free gift of salvation. That's the gospel message. It's based right there in the origin account in Genesis. And so when you look at these two aspects here, from a biblical perspective, man brought sin and death, but from a perspective of those who believe in millions of years, death has always been here. And here's another challenge for us. 
There are many Christians that say, well, there's nothing wrong with believing in millions of years and, and evolution as a Christian. And I would certainly not question you're a Christian if you believe in millions of years or evolution because uh, the, the message of salvation is not conditioned upon what you believe about the age of the earth. It's faith in Christ. But if you believe in millions of years, here's a challenge for us. In the fossil record, there's a lot of research now done to show that there's lots of evidence of diseases like cancer in dinosaur bones, arthritis. In fact, not just dinosaur bones, but other bones. If you have all these diseases before man, millions of years before man, but after God made man, he said everything is very good, that means if God created over millions of years, he would be calling cancer very good. And if the Bible says without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins, if there was a shedding of blood millions of years before man, then what does that mean, that without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sins? And then there's an implication uh, here in regard to geology, because that would mean that layers like you have at the Grand Canyon, like you have all over the world with fossils in them, would have to be formed after Adam's sin, if death didn't come until after Adam's sin. Well, the Bible gives an account of the flood of Noah's day. If there really was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And by the way, you find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And we have a PhD geologist, Dr. Andrew Snelling, uh, and we have others as well but, uh, who work on, on geology. And they say, you know, as they look at uh, these sedimentary layers, the evidence supports catastrophism, not slow processes over millions of years. For instance, at the Grand Canyon, uh, the Coconino sandstone here laid down on the Hermit Shale. When you have a look at the boundary, there's supposed to be 10 million years or so in there that they say is missing. But when you look at those boundaries, it looks like they were laid directly on top of each other. So we would say the 10 million years was never there. Another example would be uh, the Temple Butte limestone that's laid directly upon the Moab limestone. There's 140 million years supposed to be missing there. And we'd say, no, they were laid directly on top of each other. When you look at, at the evidence, no evidence of massive erosion or anything like that over millions of years. But the other thing is, you see here, the sediments have been deformed. They've been bent. And there's no major fracturing. And we believe it's soft sediment uh, deformation. In fact, when you go to the Grand Canyon, you have to go up because the canyon cuts through the Kaibab upwalk, the plateau. And you can actually go to the places where you see where the bending occurred. And our, our prediction would be the evidence here would show that these were bent when they were still soft uh, because there's no evidence of metamorphic processes happening, millions of years of heat and pressure over millions of years, and uh, no evidence of major fracturing. In fact, Dr. Snelling's done a lot of research at the Grand Canyon, and about three years ago, he applied for permits to go in here, because nobody's ever done this. Go get the samples from where you have this deformation here, and to be able to take them and do thin sections. You can actually look at the grains under a microscope, and you can determine whether they were cemented together a long time ago, or whether there's been soft sediment deformation. There's all sorts of ways of analyzing that, but nobody's ever done that. And so he requested a permit to go and do that research, and he battled for three years and it was denied. And here's another problem that we have in our culture. One of the things that we find, you know, people often say to us, if you creationists uh, are, are real scientists, why don't you publish in, in the in mainline secular journals? Well, actually, many of them do have articles published in those journals. You probably just don't recognize them. But besides that, when you're known to be a creationist, those articles often just get rejected because you're a creationist. And that has been documented many, many times. Here's an example I'll document for you right now. Because of freedom of information, we applied to find out why his permit was rejected for three years and found out a lot of secular professors had been contacted by the Grand Canyon National Parks Department. And this one from the University of New Mexico said in a letter to, to them, Snelling is a creationist who appears to wish to advance his faith that Noah's flood deposited the Cambrian strata. It's not a valid scientific research proposal in my view. Because of his worldview, he shouldn't be allowed to do that research. And then this one from the University of Wyoming, your internal screening process should include an examination of the credentials of the submitters so that those who represent inappropriate interests should be screened out. In other words, uh, that person is saying, because you're a creationist, you shouldn't be allowed to do that research. So as soon as we got this, because there's something called the First Amendment in America, we had the Alliance Defending Freedom Organization launch a lawsuit against the Grand Canyon National Parks Department, which means basically against the federal government. And um, 
when we submitted that evidence of those letters and other things as well, <coughs> excuse me, I've had one of those dreaded flus and my throat is a little bad, but anyway, uh, we'll see what we can do. I, mean, I tell people that the answer's in Genesis, it's all because of sin, uh, actually. So when we launched that lawsuit, the Grand Canyon National Park Department realised they had a problem. Uh, they were denying the free exercise of religion. It was very obvious it was discrimination because of our, our particular position. And so they gave him the permit. He's been down there collecting the samples. He's already been getting a lot of the results back in. And um, I, I'll just say this. I, I, I can't tell you what the results are right now, but it's, it's very encouraging for us. Uh, let's put it that way. And he's going to publish the... Well, he's actually going to write some very technical papers and publish all of the data, but I really wonder if any of the secular journals will publish it. He'll offer it to them. But because he's a creationist, and I believe what they're going to find is this fits with the predictions of the creationists, not those who believe the sediments were laid down over millions of years. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But we do do real research like that. And then the Tower of Babel after the flood... As people increased on the earth, the Bible makes it clear that uh, God gave different languages and so as a result you form different people groups, not different races. In fact, from a biblical perspective, uh, there's one man to start with, Adam, the first man, Adam, uh, Eve, the mother of all the living, so one woman to start with. They had sons and daughters, not just three sons as many people think. And the Bible makes it clear, God made of one man, from one blood, all nations, for to dwell on the face of the earth. The prediction from the Bible, then, is there's one biological race. We're all equal before God. Every one of us. We're all one family. Now, it's interesting, when the Human Genome Project, headed by an atheist, Dr. Venter, who's a great scientist, uh, actually sequenced the human genome in the year 2000, here's what they said uh, for the New York Times. They unanimously declared there's only one race, the human race. Wow, who would have thought of that? There's only one race. See, that, that's not proving the Bible's true, but it's certainly confirming uh, what we would predict from the basis of the Bible. It's interesting, when you look at Darwin's work and his book, The Descent of Man, 12 Years After the Origin of Species, in The Descent of Man, he actually talked about savage races, primitive races, higher races. He talked about the higher race. He actually said the Caucasians would, would exterminate some of the lower races. He had the Australian Aborigines actually closer to the apes than what he called Caucasians. No wonder uh, Dr. Stephen Jay Gould, the late Stephen Jay Gould from Harvard University, said biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. In fact, in the 1900s, actually in 1925, uh, John Scopes was supposedly teaching from this uh, textbook. But one of the main textbooks used in the public schools in America was Civic Biology by Hunter. And when you uh, read that book, you'll find it was teaching the students at the present time there exist upon Earth five races or varieties of man and finally the highest type of all the Caucasians represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. See, that would pain me to see something that would fuel racism in those young people in the public schools. But you can't deny the fact that they base that on Darwin's ideas from the descent of man. We would say the Tower of Babel resulted in different people groups. That's why you have flood legends all over the world, by the way. And that's why you have specific characteristics for each of those groups as they were isolated from each other. People often say to us, but, but then how do you explain skin colour, black people and white people? Actually, everyone is the same skin colour. Uh, the main pigment is a pigment called melanin. There's a couple of forms of it. It's basically a brown uh, pigment. And uh, in the skin, in the epidermis, you have these cells, melanocytes, uh, that have these organelles, melanosomes, uh, that actually produce these packages of melanin. And it, it's all based on your genetics. For instance, a person who's darkly pigmented uh, will have a lot more of those melanin packages because those melanocytes sort of have like these tentacles that extend up through the cells and deposit uh, the melanin there. And really, everyone is the same skin colour, you're just different shades. And so it's not what colour you are, it's what shade you are. See, one of the things I'm saying to you is, hey, from a biblical perspective, we've got the answer to racism, we're all descendants of one man, we're all equal before God, uh, we're all sinners, uh, so... Uh, we should be treating each other as people who are all family. Now, the other thing is this. The other thing is that what you believe about where you came from does affect your whole worldview. Uh, for instance, um, how do you determine what's right and what's wrong? 
How do you determine uh, how you should view uh, social issues and so on? In my conversation with Bill Nye, and when I took him through the arc the day after it was opened, I, I want to give you a little excerpt from uh, an interesting interaction that occurred. So let me ask a question. How do you determine what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, on what basis? Like if these young people over here want to know what's right and what's wrong, how do you determine that? Two ways. Mm -hmm. First of all, based on what I feel mm -hmm. as a member of the human tribe. So feelings, so sub they're subjective. Absolutely. So your what feelings. We call subjective. Okay, but your we feelings. Call a result of uh, altruism. So your fi your feel. feelings could be different to somebody else's feelings. So the second thing. Is, Correct. Your feelings could be different absolutely. to somebody else. The so somebody can have a different morality to you. Different morality. I'm open-minded, but a little skeptical. A different view of a specific event. Okay. So if somebody said to you, "I think types like you are dangerous. I want to get rid of you," would you say that's right or wrong? It depends. Okay. Okay? And here's right. the second thing. Mm -hmm. You remember I mentioned there were two things. Mm -hmm. The second thing is we establish laws by consensus. By consensus. So Our different... tribe gets together okay. and decides what's right and wrong. Okay. We so not only that, we, decide, we, just, we agree on degrees of rightness and wrongness. Okay. A parking so... ticket, not as serious as running somebody over with your car. So there could be a different consensus by a different group. Absolutely, and this process is what we call You just it. said absolutely, but that's an absolute. Very much. You said that. Okay, so here's the point. How do you determine what's right and what's wrong, and why is what you believe right and wrong? Um, why do you believe that should be the way to think about things? See, what we would say is if there's no absolute authority, ultimately anything goes unless you can get a consensus to, oppose, to impose particular views. And then I want to go on and deal with some other issues. They can be quite emotional for people, and that's okay, uh, because we need to deal with them. Because I want you to understand why we as Christians believe the way we do. And as I said to you, my starting point is the Bible. Now, let me say right at the outset, if you don't believe the Bible and your starting point is not the Bible, I totally get it why you have a different worldview to me. Because the, we have a clash of worldviews, but, but the argument's not really up here. It's really down here as to why we have that worldview. That's where the real argument is. Uh, for instance, we start off and it says that God created man in his image. No animal was created in God's image. And it says male and female, he created them. That, for me, sorts out the gender issue right there. God created male and female. And he created man in his own image. Here's a picture of a fertilized egg at the cle first cleavage stage, the first uh, division. But the reason I want to show you that is for this reason. When you have a fertilized human egg, all the information that builds you as a human is there. No new information is added. And it's a unique combination of information. The information came from the mother, from the father. It's a unique combination. No new information is added, which means you're 100% human at fertilization which means abortion is killing a human being. And that's what I would say as a Christian as to why it's wrong. The Bible goes on and says that God made Adam from dust and he put Adam to sleep and he made from his side a woman. Uh, even in the New Testament, Paul says woman came from the man, not from some ape-like creature, but from the man. And then Adam said this. This is the, basically the first poetry in the Bible. It's very romantic, by the way. A last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. You shall be called woman because you were taken out of man. And then the Bible goes on and says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave fast to his wife and they will be one flesh. This was the first marriage. A male and female, a man from dust, a woman from his side. And that's why Christians believe marriage is to be a man and a woman. In fact, in the New Testament, in Matthew 19, Jesus, the Son of God, who's the truth, said... When asked about marriage, haven't you read, and then quotes the history in Genesis. God made them male and female, and therefore shall a man cleave unto his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. In other words, Jesus was saying that history in Genesis gives the foundation of the institution of marriage, which is why marriage is to be one man and one woman. Now, if you don't believe Genesis is literal history, I totally get it. You'll have a different worldview to me. And really, the, the issues, you know, when we talk about racism and prejudice and abortion and gay marriage, they're not really the arguments. 
There, because really the argument is down here, why do you believe the way you do? Why, why do I believe the way I do? The argument is really a foundational one. And it really comes down to, well, why do you believe the Bible is true? See, when you, when you ask me that question, then you're getting to the foundation of what it's all about. And if we can never get you to believe the Bible is true like I do, we're never going to agree on our worldview. That's just the way it's going to be. And we need to uh, understand that with each other. Actually, for Christians, every single biblical doctrine of theology is actually founded in the book of Genesis. Think about this. Gen in Genesis 1 to 11, you have the origin of sin, the origin of death, the origin of the seven-day week. Why do we have a seven-day week? The origin of clothing, the origin of marriage. Um, why did Jesus die on a cross? Why is he called the last Adam? He takes the place of the first Adam. So for Christians, Genesis 1 to 11, that account of origins, uh, is actually the foundational history for all of our doctrine, for our whole worldview. And so here's the bottom line to sum it up. When you start with the Bible, like I do, then we would say there's one race of people, we're all equal before God, we're all sinners. Uh, marriage, one man and one woman, because God created marriage. Uh, gender, God made male and female. Abortion, well, uh, abortion is killing a human being. But if you start with a different foundation, like Bill Nye, uh, now Bill Nye supports abortion and so on, he has a whole different worldview to me, but he believes everything's a result of natural processes. Well, if you don't start with the Bible, you could interpret race however you wanted to, marriage however you wanted to, gender however you wanted to, abortion if we're just animals, uh, what does it matter anyway? And there's the conflict right there, a conflict between two worldviews because we have two totally different uh, foundations. And to, to finish off with, I had an interesting discussion with Bill Nye uh, about ultimate purpose when it comes to understanding who we are. And I want you to listen what happened here. In your worldview, when you die, what happens to you? You're done. You're done. So why and if that turns out not to be true, yeah. that'll be very exciting. Okay, but if you say you're done, so you won't even know you were ever here. Apparently not. So then, why do you care what, what we're doing here? Why do you care about climate change? Why do, why do you ultimately, because ultimately when all these people die, they're done and mm, nothing has any ultimate purpose. So why now, does it matter? Why does it matter ultimately? So let's be clear. Okay. What we do is make more people. What no. organisms do is reproduce. But, but still when they die, they're done. So why does it so matter? So my claim. Why, why does it matter ultimately? My claim is that not only your size and shape, number of fingers, eye color and so on, uh -huh. is a result of the main idea in all biology, uh -huh. evolution. Uh -huh. Not only is evolution the main idea in biology, but what you feel is also a result of evolution. But, but why does that matter if you're done when you die? I mean, why does what? it, oh, why does it all be matter? Everyone's done, they won't even know they're here. Why you're does asking this... fundamental existential questions. This is, yeah, this but, is but, great, but, Mr. Ham. But why? The idea is to pass your genes on to the future. To, but they, they're so, going to they're gonna die and be done too. So but they'll become so, maybe they will achieve great things and inspire us. Maybe they'll the, find out what happened before the Big Bang. What, what does it matter? Maybe they'll they, determine whether or not the core of Jupiter is hydrogen acting like a metal, or if it's really metal. And why does that matter to them when they're done? Because maybe we will discover a new source of energy that will power the whole world based and, on this new physics. And why does that matter when they're done? Anyway, it went on for a while. And that, uh, and that sort of is the challenge that I have for us, uh, ultimately. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've done, just while Dr. Pert, while Dr. Purdom comes now to get ready for uh, her section, uh, we have made available some of our materials to you at less than cost price. Uh, this is a brand new book by one of our scientists, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, who's a PhD from Harvard University. And uh, he has done a lot of, this has got a lot of technical material on genetics, speciation, natural selection. He is challenging Darwin's basic ideas. And he's thrown down the gauntlet there. And it's an incredible book, but it's normally $25. It's a hardcover, fairly thick book. Um, but you can have any of these for $5. You saw the books as you came in. And this is only, only here. No other time you're going to get them for these prices. And then we have four answers books and a flood of evidence, our fifth one. The most asked questions that people ask us about the Bible, creation, origins, we've answered there uh, in detail in those five books. And a book uh, that I have there that... Uh, challenges Christians concerning the importance of the book uh, of Genesis. You can have all those for five dollars uh, because we want to give you the opportunity to, to get them. And with that, I'm going to ask Dr. Georgia Purnham to come and do the second session.
Well, thank you, and I echo uh, Ken's statement. It's just a pleasure to be here, um, and this is the first time I've ever been in the, in the state of Oklahoma, and it's very windy here. Um, <laughs> They said, this actually isn't that bad, and I thought, wow, okay, I thought it was windy in Kentucky, but it's much windier here. Well, it is a pleasure to be here, and I'm going to elaborate on um, some of the things that Ken talked about, um, because I am a geneticist and a biologist, and so that's where I'm going to focus my attention, and, and Ken talked about um, observational science, and, um, and he actually talked about two types of science, but observational is observable, testable, repeatable. It's what I call here and now science. It's what scientists do in the lab um, every day. It gives us medicine and technology and all kinds of advancements, but it's very different from historical science because that encompasses one-time events like creation and evolution that have happened in the past. They're not observable, they're not testable, and they're not repeatable. So what I'm going to address in the next half hour is, does what we observe today in science, okay, observable science, is it consistent with and does it support evolution? Okay, that's, that's the ultimate question that we're going to try to answer in a half an hour. Um, so we're going to look at two big questions, and I focus on these because they're really the two main uh, driving forces for evolution. And those two questions are this, do mutations add the novel traits necessary for molecules to man evolution? And, and when we use that term molecules to man, you've got to think about the evolutionary tree of life, right? That all organisms have descended by modification from a single-celled common ancestor over um, millions and billions of years. And so do mutations do what evolution needs them to do? And then can natural selection, in addition to mutation, lead to changes that given time produce new kinds of animals? And, and the reason I focus on these two is, again, because these are things that we can observe in um, the present. And so we can study them and, and we can research them. And so the question is, are they consistent and do they support the evolutionary model? So let's first of all talk about mutations. Can they add novel traits? Okay, because obviously to go from a single-celled organism up to mankind and every other living thing, you're going to have to be able to add new things. Okay, and so can mutations do that? They are supposed to. They're supposed to, according to evolutionary models, provide uh, the raw material, the variation in the DNA that then natural selection can act on. So is that what we observe with mutations? Is it consistent for what is needed or required by evolution? Now, the thing with mutations is that they only alter what's already there, okay? They only alter existing DNA and usually resulting in either no change or a detrimental change. Uh, things like, we usually think of things like cancer and disease, okay? Things that are not um, normal, they're abnormal and they're not good. Now, some people might say, yeah, but what about beneficial mutations? Um, I agree, there are beneficial mutations. There are mutations that can be helpful to organisms in specific environments to help them adapt, but it still doesn't do what evolution requires it to do, which is the addition of novel traits and characteristics. They're not on their way to becoming something else. They're just a slight variation of something that they already had, an already existing trait. Now, I want to take a look at a couple examples of uh, mutations that are commonly used in support of evolution. Uh, one is a bit more basic, one's a bit more technical um, to help you understand this. So the first is antibiotic-resistant bacteria that's used as a textbook example, typically, of evolution in action. And so we're going to talk about um, Helicobacter pylori, or H. pylori, which is the bacteria that is known to cause ulcers, all right? So if you have an ulcer and you test positive for this bacteria, the doctor will give you an antibiotic. It will be absorbed through the cell wall, and H. pylori actually produce an enzyme that then will convert that antibiotic into a poison. Now, that enzyme or that protein, the bacteria makes it on a regular basis to break down nutrients. That's its normal job, so to speak. But it can also convert the antibiotic into a poison, which if you have an ulcer is a good thing because that poison then causes the bacteria to die. Okay, and so then hopefully you're cured of your ulcer. Now, the problem is, because of the overuse and misuse of antibiotics, some H. pylori have developed um, mutations in their DNA. 
and um, they have become resistant to the antibiotics. So in that case, if you have a mutant H. pylori infection, the antibiotic, they'll give you the antibiotic, it gets absorbed through the cell wall, but unfortunately, they have, these bacteria have a mutation in their DNA that does not allow them to produce the enzyme or the protein anymore, and so, What's the result of that? Well, they can't convert the antibiotic into a poison and they don't die, okay? Which is obviously good for them, bad for you. Now, the thing is, is that they have paid a price um, for this mutation, right? They've actually lost something that they normally had. And it might be beneficial in an environment where there are antibiotics that will be able to survive better, obviously, than, ever, and than anything else. But it's not the gain of traits necessary for molecules to man evolution. So just in summary, again, the normal guys, yeah, you add the antibiotic, they die. You, with the mutant guys, you add the antibiotic, they survive. But why, again, do they survive? They survive because they've lost something. They've lost the ability to produce an enzyme they normally produce. But then you need a gain. If you want to go from molecules to man, you've got to be able to gain things. Mutations only alter what's already there. They don't lead to the origin of new traits or characteristics, which is what you need. It's a requirement for evolution. The bacteria is not evolving. It's not on some vertical trajectory to becoming something else. It's merely on a horizontal trajectory where you have variation within the bacterial species. And in one research study that was actually done looking at um, different antibiotics and how bacteria have become resistant to those antibiotics, it was discovered that in every case it was due to a loss of something or reduction of something on the part of the bacteria. So again, the mutations are changing the existing, already existing DNA um, in, in ways that are beneficial uh, to those bacteria when they're in an environment where there's lots of antibiotics but not beneficial overall. It's reduced their fitness because they have lost something. So it's not a mechanism by which new traits or characteristics could originate, but that's what you need for evolution. A lot of times um, they will say, well, to go from one type of organism to a completely different kind of organism, you just gotta give mutations time, okay? Um, a lot of times that's what the evolutionary model postulates, that time is the key. And I would like to argue that time is not the key. What you need is a genetic mechanism that lets you gain new and novel traits. And the thing is, is that that's never been observed. I always say that I will give evolution trillions of years. They can have all the time it wants. But you need, it will never work because you don't have that genetic mechanism to do what evolution needs it to do. It's kind of like if I wanted to go from this side of the stage to the other side, um, but I can only take steps backwards and I can't go in a circle, okay? I'm never gonna get there. It doesn't matter how much time you get me, I'll never get there. Be and it's the same way with um, evolution. You've got to have a genetic mechanism and you simply don't. Now I want to move on to a little more technical example, and that is um, the work of Richard Linsky at Michigan State University. Um, Richard Linsky has um, what are called long-term lines of E. coli. He's been growing this E. coli continuously in his lab since 1988, and he has generated over 64,000 generations of E. coli. And um, he has observed changes in those bacteria over time. I don't know of any scientists, whether they're creationists or evolutionists, that's going to debate that. And I'm actually a great admirer of Dr. Linsky's work. I think he's done an amazing job um, with this particular experiment. Yet some um, evolutionary biologists, like Jerry Coyne at the University of Chicago, think that Linsky's work is yet another textbook example of evolution in action. Coyne said this, Linsky's experiment is also yet another poke in the eye for anti-evolutionists. That would be me. Um, the thing I like most is it says you can get these complex traits evolving by a combination of unlikely events. That's just what creationists say can't happen. All right, so again, this falls into the category of observational science. Has Linsky's research shown the formation of complex traits? via mutation and natural selection. Okay, has it done that? Because this is something we can study in the present. Linsky has done that. So um, I, will, I do agree with Linsky that the fitness of his bacteria that he has, 64,000 generations out, they're more fit than the bacteria that he started with. Okay, I would agree with that. But I would say it's more fit in a way, okay, or in a manner of speaking. So let me explain what I mean by that. 
Um, so they have studied these bacteria genetically, and they know the genetic reasons why they have changed and why they have become the way they have. And what they have noticed is that they have become more fit because they've lost things, okay? So a lot of times they become more fit because certain genes have been inactivated, they've lost or decreased the function of certain proteins, and they've lost certain regulatory control. So what have they become? They've become more fit to live in the lab, okay, in that particular setting. They've not become more fit to live um, overall. Their fitness overall has actually been greatly reduced. I always say they've gotten lazy and fat, okay? Um, just staying in the lab. Uh, some of them even lost their ability to move, right? They lose their motility genes. They don't need to go anywhere for food, right? They get it every day, so they don't have to. You take these same E. coli, you put them in the bacteria, you put them in the soil outside your home, and they're gonna die, okay, very, very quickly because they're specialized and adapted to live in a lab through the loss of things, not the gain of anything. But again, what do you need for evolution? You've got to have a gain. Mutations only alter what's already there. They don't add or they don't lead to the origin of new traits or novel traits needed for evolution to occur. Again, it's a vertical, it's a, it's a horizontal trajectory, right? You're getting, you're getting variation within these bacteria, within E. coli, but you're certainly not getting them to become something other than E. coli. Now, one of Linsky's most famous discoveries in his bacteria um, was the supposedly novel use of citrate. Citrate is a carbon source that E. coli can use. And one science journalist commenting on Linsky's discovery said, a major innovation has unfurled right in the front of researchers' eyes. It's the first time evolution has been caught in the act of making such a rare and complex trait. So is that what happened? Was it really a major innovation? Was it something new, rare, and complex? Because that's the claim. But yet what we see upon observing the mutation is actually something very different. See, normal E. coli can already use citrate. They already have all the proteins they need to utilize citrate as a carbon source, but they only do it when oxygen is low, okay? That's the only time they do it. Linsky's mutant E. coli, okay, that he's had in the lab after so many generations, acquire mutations that allow them to use citrate when oxygen levels are normal, right? So it's not the evolution of a new trait because they already had the ability to use citrate, but rather the ability to use an already existing trait under new conditions or under different conditions. This is nothing really more than just a change in regulation, okay? Um, and just when it uses it. Yet what did the authors of the paper even say about their own findings? Evolution experiments with microorganisms offered unparalleled opportunities to assess the evolution of novel traits. But that's not what they discovered. It's not something new. It already had it. It's just using it under a different condition. So the question is, how is that going to help them understand how an organism can gain the new traits required by evolution? Bottom line is, it doesn't and it won't. There's no way. You can't change one kind of organism into a completely different kind of organism by just changing the regulation of already existing traits. You need new things to go up the evolutionary tree if you're going to evolve from one kind of organism into a completely different kind of organism over time. So mutation doesn't do that. It's not a mechanism that will allow you to gain the novel traits necessary for moving up that evolutionary tree from simple to complex. It only acts on already existing DNA that, I'll give it, maybe granted and maybe beneficial in certain environments, but not beneficial overall because the fitness is typically reduced and therefore it's not a mechanism by which new traits and new characteristics can originate, but that's what you need for evolution. All right, let's talk about natural selection now. Can it lead to changes at given time produce new kinds of animals? Natural selection is said to select either for or against the genetic changes that are caused by mutations, leading ultimately to the gain of, again, novel traits and characteristics and up the evolutionary tree from molecules to man. So is that what we observe? Because again, we can observe natural selection in the present. Does it do what evolution requires it to do? Now, I want to start off by, first of all, defining what we mean by natural selection and evolution, because they are two very different processes, yet often they are equated. So natural selection is a process by which individuals possessing a set of traits, for example, fur color, because that's the example I'm going to use, that confer a survival advantage in a given environment 
leave more offspring on average that survive to reproduce in the next generation. Okay, so this is something, again, that we observe. So we're going to use bunnies, okay? So let's say we have white, black, and brown bunnies. And let's say these bunnies live in the Arctic, where it's very cold and there's lots of snow and ice. And so, obviously, the white bunnies are going to survive because they're more camouflaged, and the brown and black bunnies, over time, will decline. Okay, that's just a very simplistic example of natural selection, which we have observed over and over again. Now, Ken mentioned this, and, and I want to mention again, because I want to set the record straight. Creationists absolutely do believe in natural selection, okay? It is an observable um, process, and it can lead to speciation and variation within populations of organisms. Um, I don't know of anyone that debates that, so to speak, even within the creation realm. And I think, though, oftentimes people say that creationists don't believe in natural selection is because what has happened? People have equated natural selection with evolution, said they're the same thing, but they're not, okay? Because they're two very different things. Because evolution is the idea that all life on Earth has come into existence by descent with modification from a single-celled common ancestor, what we call molecules to man evolution. It's a but again, it's a requirement for new traits, okay? Not just slight alterations like we saw with the bunnies where you have more, brown and, have more white bunnies and less brown and black bunnies, but new things as organisms evolve from simple to complex. And this is not observable because it's happened over long periods of time, okay? It falls into, in that sense into the category of historical science. So natural selection and evolution are two very different things, like I say, even though they're often equated. So what are the results of natural selection? Well, you get the loss or the alteration of traits, like we saw with the bunnies, right? The brown and the black fur, those traits get lost, or those particular variations get lost, and, the, and only the white, white fur is there. But what do you need for evolution? You've got to have a gain of new traits, okay? Uh, with natural selection, it's non-directional, right? It's just horizontal change, basically. Um, you're getting variation within population. It's not directional. It's not going from molecules to man. And with natural selection, it's really consistent with what we call creation's orchard, okay? We see that. That's what natural selection results in. But evolution requires, again, a movement up the evolutionary tree of life from simple to complex. Um, so what we see is that these different kinds of animals that God created, and we see variation within those kinds, but we don't see one kind of animal becoming a different kind of animal, like dinosaurs evolving into birds. That's not something that we um, observe. So the problem is that natural selection doesn't do what evolution requires. Not only are they two different things, but natural selection can't even be a mechanism for evolution. Now again, we're going to look at a couple of examples of natural selection that are used in support of evolution. Um, one is uh, more hypothetical, just to sort of help you understand, again, the basic principles of natural selection, and others a bit more technical, uh, real-life examples. Let's talk about dogs, okay? Ken mentioned that. Um, this is my dog, Harley. Um, he is a mix, isn't he cute? Oh, he is adorable, all right? I love him to death. Um, he is a mixture of a black lab and I don't know what else, okay? Possibly German Shepherd, possibly Collie, something's keeping him kind of on the small side. Um, and we all love our dogs, right? But we know that both in the wild and domestically that we have many different species and breeds of dogs, okay? Some of that through artificial selection, which we're going to talk about, and some through um, natural selection as well as many other mechanisms, okay? Um, again, there's only so much I can fit in 30 minutes here, but um, there are other mechanisms at work here, like genetic drift, like migration, okay? This is just, again, a simple example to help you understand how natural selection works. So let's say that we have two dogs and they both have medium hair, okay, as far as the length goes. And so they have the, a combination of genes, L for long, S for short. So the combination gives medium. So what other possible offspring? They can have short hair dogs, they can have medium hair dogs, and they can have um, long hair dogs, okay? Those are the three possibilities that we have. Hopefully the, there's the other guy. All right. So, he didn't want to come on the screen. Now, let's say that these dogs go to a place that's very cold. Let's say they live in Siberia, okay, where it's very, very cold all the time. What's going to happen, all right? So the short and medium hair dogs are really ill-equipped to live there, and over time, as the population survives and reproduces, because this is how natural selection works, those dogs would likely die out. Just leaving... Oh, I'm sorry, okay, that's how it works, right? And a curse is a cursed world, so this is how things work. 
Um, so all you have left is the long hair dogs, right? Now notice what's happened. The S version of that hair gene has completely disappeared. It's gone from the population. That's what natural selection does, okay? It selects for or against certain traits um, in a given environment leading to the weeding out of genetic variety. Um, there's no gain of traits or characteristics that is required for evolution. It's actually a loss. In this case, the loss of the ability to produce short hair. So if all you have are long-haired dogs, that's all you're going to get, okay, is long, more long-haired dogs. Now, some people might say, well, what if you got a mutation in one of the L genes and it went back to an S gene? Wouldn't that be a gain of a new trait? I said, nope. I'm not saying that couldn't happen. It certainly could. But it's not something new. It's just a reintroduction of something it already possessed at one point in that population. It's not what you need for evolution. You need brand new spanking things to go from one kind of organism to a completely different kind of organism. This doesn't help you go from a dog to a non-dog, okay? This just allows you to have variation within the dog kinds. And really, too, what natural selection does is these organism be organisms become so specialized for their environment, what happens if they move to an area that's really warm? Mm, the long-haired dogs aren't going to do too well, are they? And populations go extinct sometimes as a result of that because they just can't adapt. They become so well-adapted to one environment, they can't change when the environment changes. So while natural selection can and does lead to speciation in dogs and other living organisms, it simply cannot do what evolution requires it to do um, because it's going in the opposite direction. Dogs stay dogs and get more specialized or adapt it for various environments. They don't change to non-dogs. And as I said before, for mutations, time is not the key. Okay, like I say, I, I don't care if you give natural selection trillions of years. I give it all the time they want, but it can only select for or against what already is there. It does not have the ability to generate anything new. And we know that mutations can't do that either. So these, this doesn't work for evolution. You've got to have a genetic mechanism. Now I want to move on to something that's a real, more of a real life, well actually is a real life, um, more technical example of this. And there was an article published a few years ago in the journal um, Trends in Genetics, and it really demonstrated the dilemma between what natural selection does and what evolution requires it to do. So it was entitled A Golden Age for Evolutionary Genetics, Genomic Studies of Adaptation in Natural Population. And these, um, these are evolutionary biologists, okay, they are not creationists, um, but they say the abstract begins by talking about natural selection and adaptations and how it's been studied in the present. But the very last sentence of this abstract says this, nonetheless, most studies of recent evolution involve the loss of traits. And we still understand little of the genetic changes needed in the origin of novel traits. Yes, exactly, okay? Because they're not, it's hard because they just, we see a lot of trait loss, but they just don't see any gain. So they give several examples of natural selection, things like pigmentation, lightning, and darkening in uh, Mexican tetras, the blind cavefish, um, wing color pattern changes in butterflies, and the loss of pelvic spines and structures um, and armor plating in stickleback fish. These are great examples of natural selection or adaptation of populations to changing environments. I don't know of any evolutionist or creation scientist that would debate that. We don't. That, we can observe that in the present. But there's no gain of new traits or characteristics um, required. There's no direction here. Butterflies are still butterflies. Sticklebacks are still sticklebacks. And cavefish are still cavefish. Now, towards the end of the paper, they have a section entitled Origins of Novelty, and they say this. Many of the well-studied examples of adaptive evolution have involved trait loss, like the examples I just gave. It says, however, over the broad sweep of evolutionary time, what we would really like to explain is the gain of complexity and the origins of novel adaptations. Yes, that's what you have to explain for the evolutionary model to be true. You've got to have mechanisms that enable you to do this. So, how do the authors resolve this problem? Because it is very much a problem. Um, because natural selection isn't resulting in the gains that they need for evolution, so they say this. Of course, to some extent, the difference between loss and gain could be a question of semantics. So, for example, the loss of trichomes, which is a hair-like appendage on flies, could be called the gain of naked cuticle. Okay, here's the thing. Renaming it doesn't change anything. Okay? It's kind of the equivalent, here's how I put it, it's the equivalent to a person who suddenly lost all their money saying, I've not lost money, I've gained poverty. 
Okay. It makes you sound really positive, but it doesn't change anything, does it? Because you still don't have any money, and, and that's the problem, right? You, you can say it however you want, but that's not going to change what that you need gains in order for evolution to occur. Um, and so that's the problem, because natural selection doesn't provide a mechanism to gain those new traits. So what we've seen is, yes, natural selection definitely leads to a loss or an alteration of traits, but it does not lead to the gain of traits required by evolution. It is non-directional. It's not moving from simple to complex. Um, we're merely seeing variation within those organisms, and it is absolutely consistent with creation's orchard. We do see variation within kinds that God has created, but not the movement up the evolutionary tree. And again, time is not the key, okay? You can't, like I say, you can have all the time you want, but you've got to have mechanisms that allow you to gain the novel traits necessary to go from one kind of organism to a different kind of organism, and we have never observed those kinds of changes. Um, so natural selection can't be that mechanism, and mutation can't be that mechanism, because they just don't do what evolution needs them to do. Now, so going back to our original two questions that we had, do mutations add novel traits? Can natural selection lead to changes at given time produce new kinds of animal? And the answer to that is no. Okay, they just simply don't do what evolution needs them to do. Now, you might be asking, okay, but how do creationists then explain the speciation within the kinds that God has created? Because how do you explain how we get all the dog species and breeds from just two members of dogs that were on the ark just a few thousand years ago? Right? Because that seems like a lot of change in just a few thousand years, right? Some people will say that's hyper evolution, what you're believing in. You're more evolution. They'll say, I'm more evolutionary than they are. Well, that's a great question, and I want to briefly explain, and then I want to tell you where you can get some more information on this. So, the um, creation model for speciation is something called created heterozygosity and natural processes, or CHNP. And uh, basically, and, and this is one that is supported by the observable evidence. Um, that we believe that God created organisms with a lot of genetic variety and that along with natural processes like natural selection, mutation, genetic drift, um, migration, all of those things acting on that genetic diversity that's already there has resulted in all the species and breeds of organisms both past, present, and will be in the future. Now let me explain what I mean by this, um, again, looking at dogs, because there's just so much studies done on dogs um, that they're easy to use as an example. Currently there are 338 breeds of dogs. Now here's the thing to remember, those breeds of dogs have only come about in the last few hundred or several hundred years through artificial selection, okay? People selecting for or against certain traits that they want the dogs to have. So we've got Great Danes, Poodles, Bulldogs, name your favorite breed, all right? Now what's interesting is, think about it, there's greater diversity within breeds of dogs than there are between individual dog species, all right? Let me show you an example. So we have the Great Dane, and we have the Yorkshire Terrier. <laughs> Whoa, right? Massive differences between those two dogs. They're obviously still dogs, but one is really big, one is really tiny, one is, um, has sort of smoother fur, one has longer fur. Okay, the, but they're the same species, right? But they're just, they would be considered different breed. But the wolf and the coyote, they're different species, even though they look a lot alike, right? You've got uh, Canis lupus and, and Canis latrans, okay? They're, they're different species, yet they look, more diff they look more similar than the Great Dane and the Yorkshire Terrier, which are considered the same species, okay? So think about how much genetic diversity must already be present in the dogs if artificial selection can accomplish this in just a few hundred years, right? Just, just a few hundred years we can get this great amount of diversity in breeds. So to kind of turn that around then, what can natural processes do in a few thousand years in the wild acting on that same created genetic diversity? If, we, if humans selecting and doing this can do this in just a few hundred, imagine what you can do in a few thousand, right? And so, um, so, that's, so that's what we talk about. A lot can happen in a short period of time because the genetic diversity is already there 
um, created by God to help organisms adapt and, and, and live in this world. And Dr. Nathaniel Jenison, who um, Ken mentioned, he has a PhD um, from Harvard, has really developed this model and has done extensive research on it. And he's published several um, peer-reviewed technical articles in Answers Research Journal, which are freely available online, like this one. Um, so if you go there um, and, and type in um, his name, Dr. Jenison, those will come up. There's also a layman version of this topic, because I realize not everybody may be a biologist. It's a 10-part series, so it's broken down into some really nice chunks called the origin of species after the flood um, and so if you go to that website there um, you can also find the technical articles on this as well and he has written about this extensively in his book replacing Darwin which uh, again I, I cannot recommend that book enough um, it really lays this model out and helps people understand it better so that is all I have I hope you will take advantage of the resources that we have to better equip you and I thank you for your time Folks, we're going to take a 15-minute uh, break. Remember now, if you have questions, write them down on the uh, insert in your program. Send it to the aisle.